Welcome back to episode 104 of Warrior's Den. Today's guest is martial arts and self-defense legend and creator of the Spear System, Tony Blauer. It was a total pleasure to have him on. Here's a little sneak peek of the chat I had with Tony. It occurred to me after decades of studying violence, fear, and aggression that if people don't manage their fear, they don't manage to fight. It's that simple. Uh, Some wise words from Tony. But first, before we get into the podcast, a message from our sponsors. Thank you for listening to the Warrior's Den podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Urban Tactics Karmaga, turning lambs into lions since 2013. If you like this podcast and our content, make sure you support us in the many various ways you can. The easy and free ways start with liking, subscribing, following, and leaving a positive review wherever you may be listening or watching. You can also follow us on social media, on Facebook, Instagram at Urban Tactics Krav Maga, and Twitter at Urban Tactics KM. You can also follow us on YouTube and Rumble at Urban Tactics Krav Maga. Another great way to support this podcast, as well as our other content, is to check out our blog at www.utkmblog.com. Here you can check out our weekly curriculum, our various blog posts, and general ideas about Krav Maga and self-defense. For those of you feeling generous, you can also click on the Support Us tab and send donations our way so we can continue providing the awesome content you love. And for those who would like a little more for their money, you can check out www.utkmu.com and learn Krav Maga and self-defense online as we teach it at our school. You can check out the various levels of curriculum with monthly or annual subscriptions and learn Krav Maga so that you too can walk in peace. Small disclaimer, UTKMU is meant to supplement your regular Krav Maga self-defense or martial arts training in person with qualified instructors and is not a substitute for in-person real training. And for those of you who want to look as good as I know you feel, you can always check out www.utkmshop.com where you can check out and buy the latest UTKM merch from us. Warning, wearing UTKM merch will not turn you from a lamb to a lion. To start your transformation from lamb to lion, you must start your training journey today. Stay consistent and never give up wherever you may be. Side effects of wearing UTK merch may be chronic bouts of kicking ass, feeling good, and learning to walk in peace. And of course, if you are in the Metro Vancouver area, come train with us in person. Sign up at www.urbantacticskm.com. I would love to help you on your journey from lamb into lion. And now, back to the episode. So if you're listening to just audio, then you would have not seen the video. I am now posting video on YouTube, Rumble, and on, of course, our blog, utkmblog.com. So if you want to check it out, go check it out. And also, it makes it awkward for the setup, so I'm trying to figure out. But I'll work through it. Uh, anyways, back to the podcast. So Tony is someone I'd wanted to talk to for a long time. I've heard nothing uh, but good things from him, from anyone that I've uh, met that's trained with him. And I've been hearing about him for years. Now, it's uh, the martial arts self-defense world always likes to think it's bigger than itself. I often talk to people that have no idea who he is. But in the martial arts and self-defense world, he's very well known, particularly in America, though he, we did talk about how he has training, trained people globally. So if you aren't sure who he is, let's check out some of his websites uh, and I'll go over a little bit more about him. Uh, so. As you can see here, this is his main website, Tony Blower Training Systems. You can check out here or uh, blowerspearsystem.com and you can see he's been doing stuff for a long time. He does garage training nowadays due to the pandemic uh, where you can train with him on Zoom. He has books. He's been Black, Black Belt Magazine. Um, He's done seminars. He does lectures all over the world. And he's been doing this for years. Don't focus on technique, focus on tactical, something I agree with. So a little bit about him again. Uh, so Tony has been in the martial arts and self-defense tactics and combatives industry for decades. He is one of the only uh, combatives uh, instructors, experts who has successfully affected training across combat-related community self-defense, combat sports, military, and law enforcement. He is, and he's not Krav Maga for the record. His research in physiology and mindset 
as it relates to confrontation. Uh, confrontation management has influenced over three decades of reality-based martial arts and enhanced survivability of law enforcement, military, emergency services, and personnel all over the world. Uh, he's founded Blauer Tactical Systems in 1985. That's before I was born. And it has grown into one of the world's leading consultant companies in the research and development of performance psychology, personal safety, close quarters tactics, and scenario-based training for law enforcement, military, and professional self-defense instructors. Uh, a little bit about more him of specifically, he has been doing martial arts, self-defense, defensive tactics, again, for decades. Um, his research in the, on the neuroscience of fear and the startle flinch uh, led to the development of the spear system, a modern personal self-defense system based on physiology, physics, and psychology. It has used by defensive tactics and combative trainers all over the world for 30 years. He developed the world's first impact reduction scenario-based training called High Year, which I love to get my hands on. Bring down the price, Tony, uh, which revolutionized force on force. You can actually uh, do full contact stuff relatively safely with full mobility, unlike a lot of other stuff, um, as well as it's just great overall. And decades of interviewing uh, victims and violence encounters, studying. He created the No Fear, K-N-O-W. We talk about this program, which focuses on managing fear through self-awareness, resilience, movement, mindset. The program has also been integrated with psychologists helping veterans with PTSD. So again, No Fear, here you can go. He also has his No Fear of podcast. You can check it out probably anywhere that podcasts are available and you can check it out his instagram while he's still on instagram uh his company ones spear systems and his personal one at tony plower um so one thing that i liked about tony i'd, I'd heard about him but i never really interacted with him up until now i was happy i got a chance to the way he teaches in many ways is very much the way i teach if you're teaching kramagar self-defense any style if you're not looking at the psychological the nervous system etc i don't know if you're teaching self-defense properly if you're just teaching techniques or just teaching aggression or just teaching that and not other aspects of a well-rounded martial arts training experience um you're not giving people the holistic aspect that self-defense truly can be. So I only had Tony for a little bit of time, but I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Krav Maga is not just a self-defense system. It is a way of life. Warriors Den is a podcast for Kravists fighters, martial artists, warriors, politicians, and general citizens. Consider this. The society that separates scholars from its warriors will have its thinking done by cowards and its fighting done by fools. Lucididi, your host, Jonathan Fader, talks to guests in an open and uncensored format about their fights, their philosophies, and their lives. No topic is taboo, and the conversation may start in one place and end in another. As the quote suggests, you cannot separate the warrior from the politics and the world around them, as a true warrior must be a student in all forms of art and science. You're listening to The Warrior's Day. The Warrior's Day. Brought to you by Urban Tactics Krav Maga. Turning lambs into lions. Okay, I am here with Tony Blauer, a pioneer in North America in self-defense and martial arts and creator of the Spear System. How are you today? I'm good, Jonathan. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great. So would you consider yourself more a self-defense expert or a fear management expert? It's funny. I was going to wear my no fear, no fear shirt today. <laughs> um, and... Uh, uh, for your listeners, no fear. We spell it K N O W. No fear. Um, I got a shirt over here. I can pull one up and, and show you. And I was actually going to wear it. I wear it most of the time uh, when I do podcasts because it 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 occurred to me after decades of studying violence, fear, and aggression that if people don't manage their fear 
they don't manage to fight. It's that simple. Uh, uh, I don't care if you see like like two freaks in the street just swinging at each other. Uh, there's also video of somebody getting the shit punched out of them that's just you know cowering. Uh, and and so when you look at whether you're looking at a professional boxing match or an MMA match, there are factors of fear management at all these levels. And I realized this uh, in the eighties, when I first started experimenting with fight club esque, um, uh, you know, force on force fighting way before fight club was a movie, uh, that, that the, the key to everything in life is fear management. So it's a tricky question because, uh, if you ask me this, if you only had to pick teaching the physical self-defense or the mindset, resilience, adaptive courage of, of fear management, I would only teach the fear management. Mm. So do, what do I consider? I, I consider myself holistically a self-defense uh, coach because holistic self-defense includes the idea of protecting ourselves emotionally, psychologically, understanding how our mind works. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that makes total sense. And it's, a, you know, my background is Krav Maga, but that's an area I found a lot of those guys were lacking. And uh, I have a little bit of a background in psychology, and I started introducing that. And if I get a beginner, I'll start with a lot of concepts first and a lot more talking. And then if you're going to commit, I'll, I'll teach them the techniques. And it, it really, it puts off a lot of people because it's not what they're expecting. What's your experience been with that? Um. Probably back in, probably back in the eighties, uh, I lost students because I was always very cerebral, always very, um, you know, just I was drawn to the mindset. As as a as a young athlete, I uh, <clears throat> I failed to uh, excel or perform the way I believed I could, and I didn't understand it. Whether I was, you know. A ten-year-old entering a, a a gymnastics tournament, or or eleven-year-old going to a wrestling tournament, or thirteen or fourteen going to a taekwondo tournament, I had ideas of of what I was capable of, but I never they never manifest in the competition. But I didn't realize what it was. It was it was performance anxiety and fear holding me back and overthinking past future, uh, and um, so I was always. Uh, uh, very very uh introspective in the classes and i think like you it it turned people off because their idea is you know one plus one is two i just come in i'm going to learn how to punch or block and and that's going to you know that's all i need to know about self-defense uh you know a lot of people still you know you go watch a john wick movie and i made a joke about this recently you know and i wrote an article for substack um where i started writing recently um that that we need to stop romanticizing violence and that that real violence doesn't look like a john wick movie mm. but still if a student comes in there and that's their expectation of like well i'm gonna kick like bruce lee and you know run up walls like jackie chan and then you're up there talking about the importance of mindset and self-awareness and situational awareness they're, they're like what the fuck is this you know <laughs> and uh I, I had, uh, you know, back in the 80s, we, we developed the whole Trojan horse metaphor, the nonviolent postures. And we had like this was our, our this was our go to self-defense program because I was always very like bound by the whole moral, ethical, legal aspect of it. I was mm. never one of those. Well, you know, you know, fuck it. You know, let's go like just break their neck. Like I was never macho. I abhorred violence. I really abhor violence. Mm. And uh but I, I had, I remember this one guy in the 80s, he, you know, when somebody quits your school, you don't know, they don't show up, they stop paying, they, you go, oh, I guess they quit. But I had one guy that was so offended by this, that he, it's like when somebody on social media now announces they're unfollowing you. you know? yeah. <laughs> it's like, you don't need to announce that, just fuck off, you don't, you don't, you know, you just leave. But this guy had to announce in the class, like, he goes, this is ridiculous. I like, I can't do this. Right. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, morally, ethically, legally, you're trying to deescalate a confrontation, but this is also a Trojan horse. That body language is 60% of communication. Mm -hmm. That if somebody sees you doing this and, and, and they decide 
to still engage and you've got a bunch of idiots filming like this is still a great fighting stance it's not that far from this yeah. it's just the change of the fingers you know splayed uh and outside aren't uh, the outside 90 angle all the research for the spear system conversion like you're in an ideal an optimal position morally ethically legally even tactically and just like how do you even argue with that he yeah. hated he's and he actually said uh uh, I, I look like a coward. I'm not going to stand like this. And uh, I quit. <laughs> he announced like, and I'm like, okay, can't help you. But it was yeah. like, it was, it was funny, man. So I'm fortunate, like up in Vancouver, people won't be confrontational. I, but I can see the look on their face when they don't like what I'm saying. And right. they're like quickly scurrying out the door before I get a chance to talk. <laughs> that just, is that just because Canadians are so nice? Oh, they yeah. I was born and raised here. I did live in Israel for a while served in the military but it, i can't stand just how you know canadians won't tell you the problem even when i ask it's like listen if i'm doing something wrong you, you need to let me know so i can get some feedback and they just will not just just i've gotten you, used to that look when i'm you know, like, you, know, you, back. Live, you know i grew up in canada i don't know if you knew that yeah i saw yeah 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 yeah, I moved to you the state. Found a new home. I was uh, me and my wife were thinking about moving to Texas when everything settles down, but we'll see. <laughs> I like it in BC, but we'll see how this country ends up. <laughs> or the world. That's very yeah, strange. Right? Uh, very now strange. I do want to get on that sort of topic, but I am curious how in the eighties, when you know, uh Bruce Lee and all the Kung Fu movies and everyone wants to be that, how you came about it becoming cerebral because it very much seems like you're one of the first people in North America to really approach a first principles approach before it was even a thing. So where does that come from? The, just the whole, the whole delving into the neuroscience and the mindset and all that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, where does anything come from? You have, you have, you know, where did Wing Chun come from? You know, you know where did, where did, uh, uh, you know, if you, if you believe all the origin stories, you know, we could be, you know, a hundred thousand years ago. I don't, I don't know when the wheel was invented or when fire was invented, but, you know, we're sitting around and we're fucking freezing. And then, you know, all of a sudden I go, Jonathan, what are you doing? And you go, and you're, we're cavemen and you go, I'm rubbing two pieces of the wood together and, and maybe they'll catch on fire. Like, like that's a stupid idea. All of a sudden there's a fire, right? Mm -hmm. You know, a, a dragging this shit is really problematic. And someone goes, well, why don't you just carve a rock into a, like the shape of a circle and it'll roll. Like who the fuck figured that out? Right. So, um, the, I don't know why, uh, I was drawn to all of that. I mean, I can tell you like origin stories and events that made me go, ah, I like, like the, the whole start of flinch that evolved into the spear system was the origin of that was a hypothesis I had where I was like, I'd want one of my private students, this kid Warren was a really good boxer. Uh, and he came in for his private one day. And I said to him, I said, dude, I, I hallucinated this drill. I want to experiment. And which is back like eighties where we had, um, you know, VHS, you know, get on a smartphone on a, on a, on a little tripod. It was like a giant cassette. Most of your listeners won't even know what VHS look, look it up, Google it. <laughs> But big RCA camera, you know, our, and, and I said, we're going to film this. And I said, we're, we're always sparring. So we, we, you know, we get in the ring and we're all going to go, we're going to isolate today. And I want to figure out how close is too close. This is my hypothesis when there's a verbal interaction, because if I said to you, Jonathan, uh, you know, get your hands up. I'm going to do something on screen here and I want you to block or slip or, or parry or do something. If we're just doing that, right. And, and I could do it with you too, but it's, it, you're in a confined space there and mm. it's weird, but you know, and I've done this with, 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 with dozens of, of people online, but your reaction time is way faster when you're not talking or I'm not talking. Mm. So one of, one of the unintended consequences of sparring and and doing scenario drills that are specific to a gun disarm a getting out of a headlock is when you don't truly understand and blend 
what's involved in a scenario, which includes the the distractions of the executive of executive function, and how how thinking and deciding impact the neuromuscular activity. So I can have you get, get ready to block me, and I throw a shot, and you'll move, and then I go, okay, you ready to do it again? You're like, yeah, and I go. Uh, but but wait a minute, you know, fix your shirt or, you know, what's your wife's name, by the way? And and, and you go, what? And I throw the punch and, and, and your hand won't even move just because I asked you a, a question, which was disinformation. It occupied executive function that mm -hmm. changed that changed the signal speed in parry block slip, get my gun, get my and nobody. Even to this day, people don't even understand the neurobiology of survival. I'm off on one of my deep tangents, apologies. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, for some reason, I was drawn to that. So we go back to 1987. I'm doing this drill with Warren. I had this hypothesis that was like, we always we were, we were really experimenting with isolation drills and see what happens. And, and so this was an isolation drill where only Warren was allowed to attack me. I wasn't allowed to move. We were going to film because what I wanted, I said, you're going to ask me any question you want. I'm going to uh, act role play. So if you say the boss wants his money, I borrowed money. If, if you say, uh, 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 Hey man, can you, can you spare me a buck? You're, you're a homeless dude. And I would, I would imagine that. And then I would, I would get into character and at whatever point he wanted to whack, whack, he would just throw a shot. It started off with one punch, two punch, three, we would build, we'd build to it. And what's interesting, if you've never heard this, the story of the origin of the sucker punch drill, which, which led to the spear system is my performance, my athletic ego thought I was going to do well. I was going to do wax on wax off all day. You know, I was going to parry slip, you know, whatever it is. I literally got the shit beaten out of me for almost an hour. I was, I had a mouse under both eyes. I was bleeding from my mouth. I had a fucking headache. It was just us in the, in the gym. And, and I say this because uh, uh, I don't know a lot of people that would continue to a drill where they lost like every, like, like every 30 seconds I lost, mm. but I, but something was happening and I trusted my intuition because Every time I got boom, hit, nailed, and I was getting fucking nailed. He had no, he had no risk. There, I wasn't allowed, I had no equipment on except for mouth guard. But every so often he'd go, you know, he'd say, uh, hey man, uh, I told you to stay away from my my girl. And I go, hey, listen, man, you, you guys broke up. I'd, I'd just come up like I'd improv. And he'd go, well, fuck you, man. Whack, and he'd, he'd throw a shot. And every so often I'd go, whoa, and my body would just flinch. And it would bounce off my forearm or my elbow or my hand. And whenever I flinched, and I wasn't trying to flinch. This is an important thing for, you know, if your audience are, 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 are technically trained, one of the confusing aspects of startle flinch is you never think to flinch. Jonathan, you flinched hundreds of times in your life. A spider, a snake, a, a mortar goes off in training and nobody said fire in the hole. Uh, you know, someone sneaks up to you and you get your headphones on and taps you on the shoulder and you're like, fuck, man. What, what people don't realize about the start of flinch is there's never conscious thought, I should flinch now. The flinch is always non-conscious. It mm -hmm. bypasses cognitive brain. It bypasses executive function. And so when I flinched in this drill in the, in the, in the 80s, it was totally instinctive and so you know he'd come at me and i go whoa and i'd flinch and you know his hand would you know it would it would hit and turn into an accidental parry and then he'd come with an overhand and i'd i'd flinch and it was just scrambling and i was like what is going on here when i'm trying to do bong sao lop sao slip parry block jam rising block you know as a good martial artist been training for a long time at this point when I tried to do those, I was, uh, I'm just going to make up a number. I was only effective 50% of the time. If everything, if angles worked out, right? Anyone's block, slip, parry is a complex motor skill. For you to execute a complex motor skill, your eyes 
have to pick up the danger, send the message to the brain, download all the, the proxemics, the distance, the time. And it's an amazing computer. And then it says, now, now, now. But action's faster than reaction. And in an ambush, the bad guy is always action. So I was discovering all this neuroscience-based movement without understanding any of it all. It was just intuition at the time. Yeah. And uh, I was fascinated by it, obviously, uh, you know, it, and it became, I mean, it became the movement that is the spear system. Yeah. I mean, it makes total sense. The model, I like to try to use models that are integrated in other areas of society. So the one that I like to use as an example was um, the Glasgow Coma Scale. Are you familiar with it? No. What is it? So it's a, it's a medical tool that people use uh, to identify the state of your nervous system from like a conscious level. So you use a pain stimulus or verbal. So they test uh, your eye movement, your verbal skills, and your physical motor skills. So I use just the motor skills. And it's a, regarding pain stimulus. So if I give you pain stimulus and you're totally conscious and you're, nothing's wrong with you cognitively, you'll just be like, what the, what the hell are you doing? So it's a verbal response and you get like a five or whatever. Right. And then uh, it goes down to I give you pain response and you just like casually push away. And then you the next one is you pulling away because you're trying to run. And then the next one down is you're actually doing the flinch response. Right. And then the last one is no response. You're like completely unconscious because even if someone's not, you know, their eyes are closed and they're not verbal, you can give a pain response and you can still get a response. So it'll actually tell the doctors where their nervous system is at. So if you get yeah. zero response, there's something really wrong. But the last ditch effort before that is flinch out uh, when yeah. you respond to a pain response, as in I need to stop this thing now or else. Right. So, you know, you found it through anecdotal practice, but in the medical field, they use that as well. And I, it can happen, I think, even with training, as you mentioned, you, you could be the most trained person in the world. And I like to connect it to um, the uh, uh, Cooper uh, mental model, white, yellow, orange, red. Because, yeah. so, you know, if you're Bruce Lee and you're in white, anyone can attack you at any time. And he'll still flinch. Now, the more mastery you have, the faster you can recover. But then, like, let's say you look at a fight like uh, Rose Naman Yunez versus uh, Wei Li Zhang, the first one where Rose's timing is totally different to what she's used to and just got that kick in. So it's like a constant battle between your nervous system state, your training and all that. But even the masters will flinch out if they're not sure, right? As you found out, of course, getting punched in the face repetitively. Yeah. You, 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 what's, what's interesting is this, is, is, as I describe it, that's very fascinating, the, uh, um, you know, the, the model you described there. Um, the, you know, the, it's not a hypothesis. It's, it's, this is, this is what happens. So the start of flinch is designed from a neuroanatomy point of view to disengage from noxious stimuli. That's the actual pedantic language in, in, in the books, disengage from noxious stimuli. It's your cross extensor reflex. And it, the, the, the initial movement comes up they don't describe it this but i've just empirically observed it you, the first initial response is to make sure your command center is protected that your your the the body intrinsically knows that if something happens to my head i'm done because that's where the brain is right mm -hmm. so it'll cover the head and then it, it, it if there's time and space between the, the perceived threat the hands will push out the body will rotate away and that's why you see in all those flinch pictures that basketball games and baseball games there there's always a finger splayed hands coming out um you google uh, uh fear on the internet every artist rendition is like something like this or something like this with the hand pushing away um so it's been people don't understand again the the uh the physiology behind it um but you mentioned something interesting untrained or trained and instead of me like that's the language we use you know um as a, you know, opposed to master or expert or, 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 or whatever, it's just you're trained or you're untrained. The, the, the risk and the danger is, is there's a lot of trained people that just assume because they read Funakoshi and they said, you know, one's true self emerges after, you know, 30,000 reps or 10,000, whatever it is, mm -hmm. that people just think there's, there's, their muscle memory will take care of things. And I always tease people lovingly, there's no such thing as muscle memory. Muscles really don't have memory, mm -hmm. but they have neural patterns. And, but the problem is this, for an act, for a trained neural pattern to 
effectively deploy. It needs to pick up the right stimulus. It then downloads the information and then it fires, right? That's that signal speed, myelin sheath, neuron, all of that. And it, and it fires the right message. So an untrained person, I go, I'm going to punch you in the face. And they're like, what are you talking about? Whack. I hit them. And they're like, oh, and they're flinching. The trained person, I go, I'm going to punch you in the face. And they go, no, you're not. And then if I'm telegraphic, they're doing whatever they were trained. Hmm. But if I say to them, hey, uh, we're going to do an experiment. But before we do, we do this, I need, I need to ask you, uh, do you have like glass draw syndrome? And they're like, I don't know, bang. And I hit them while they're talking and they go, oh, fuck. You know, hmm. they flinch exactly like the untrained person but then they beat you up because they're trained, right? So, yeah. so, so you, and you, you said it a, a, a little bit more elegantly earlier when you said like the trained person will recover faster, meaning they've got a set of tools that they can now access where if, if I give you a toolbox and you have no idea what I, the difference between a hammer and a screwdriver is, you'll just stare at it and go, well, what is this shit? But if I give a, a handyman or a carpenter or an architect that, he, they start moving. What's significant, and this is kind of serendipitous, the beginning of my conversation, you asked me about, you know, my fear management expert or self-defense. If I punch trained or untrained person in the face really hard, depending on the scenario, and this is so significant, if if they succumb to the the mindset of fear, which is producing these these negative outcomes, right? Like, like the, the part of fear that I, that I really try to help people with is, is the idea of that I'm visualizing a future event, event that, that, that involves my pain and my destruction. That's what creates the hesitation and that's what leads to fixation and unchecked that leads to non-clinical or clinical anxiety because all I'm doing is I'm working about the, worrying about the future. This is huge because there are examples of cops, military, pro fighters, overwhelmed with that fear and it's interfering with their motor skills they can't shoot they can't fight there you can see even though you go well this guy was like ranked number like in the top 10 and he's running around the ring like what why isn't he hold, why isn't he standing his ground fear fear can undermine everything so we've got um I've got these, like this, 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 I try, I try to keep things Ernie and Bert, Sesame Street simple, you know, when, when I'm teaching, but it's like, you need to have situational awareness, but situational awareness can be compromised. And this is an important thing because there are people that think they can outrun the flinch. And I mean that uh, poetically, meaning they think that if they get to a certain level, they won't flinch. But a, the, the start of flinch is part of our human physiology and is designed to protect us. Like I said, disengage with noxious stimuli is fancy for push away danger right. situational awareness is oh i should fucking run right now and 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 so the link between your instincts your intuition and and all of that is people people talk about fight flight freeze and all that i don't i don't get into that i don't even like it as a model not that it's wrong but it's a post-mortem discussion mm. I, if i'm teaching somebody to defend themselves um, I'm talking about run, barricade, attack the threat. And these should be responsive. You should be thinking what is the optimal strategy. It shouldn't be just like, like an unconscious thought. Um, but when we practice and practice and practice, we make the assumption that our muscle memory doesn't exist, will be there for us. Uh, we create an unconscious bias for our craw, for our jujitsu, for our spear even, for our whatever. And it's the unconscious bias that interferes with true situational awareness, if that makes sense. So if I got a guy, if I got a guy standing in front of me, Jonathan, and he's like, you know, I'm gonna fuck you up. And, and my intuition goes, okay, this guy is a, uh, an asocial predator, he's a psychopath, I should get the fuck out of here. But my jujitsu says, I'm gonna choke this guy out, I just need to take him down. Or my taekwondo says, oh, he's open there, I'll kick him in the head. Or my boxing said, you know, liver shot. The neural patterns of my movement can draw me in where it's now overriding my intuition, which is trying to whisper in my ear going, get the fuck out of here. Right. So, yeah. so it's, it's a, I'm fascinated with all that shit. Yeah. I mean, it makes total sense. So like, you know, for example, if I'm not an expert at Taekwondo, but I recognize the patterns, I'm like, okay, I know how to take this guy out pretty quick because he clearly only knows that one style. I can screw with their sort of 
their their patterns and it actually ties into like the reward mechanism of the brain where the most effective way to train or untrain a behavior is with random unpredictable reward patterns because the brain doesn't want when you get used to um your dopamine too much pattern it gets complacent and so it's a similar thing if you want to have effective training it needs to while you do want to have a syllabus and you want to go through it if it's always the same you're not actually preparing them for the unexpected so right. you want to randomize stuff and change it up and be unpredictable and that way it, that they don't get quite set on that pattern even if even if uh you know, they're an expert in the style is probably why MMA guys do a lot better overall in an average fight because right. they are used to all sorts of changes and timing versus say just a Taekwondo guy. It's uh, right. very similar. So that's why I'm, I find it very fascinating that you just, in a time when no one was doing it, you were into the neurological state, which was sort of tying into something you said with the police have anxieties and fears is to me, I can teach self-defense and I can also teach mental health skills because it's all just about awareness of your mental state and where you're at uh, and then tie that into everything else. So when you're teaching, do you, cause it's, you know, that it's the new thing. Do you uh, talk about mental health or is it just kind of relates to the awareness of fear thing? Cause it's all connected. I talk about resilience. I talk about adaptive courage. I keep it generic unless somebody is coming to me like one-on-one -on -one private and they're going, look, you know, so, so, so do we, you know, I, uh, we, we get that. Uh, um, we've been working in mental health for years. Uh, we have a, a program called spear care, which is for mental health hospitals. Uh, we've got, uh, psychologists that work with me to learn my approach to fear management so that they can, uh, you know, we've got one in, in, in particular whose, whose specialty is working with uh, vets with PTSD, who's found great, great, great success in our cycle behavior, neural, the neural circuitry of fear model that, that was created out of that research in the eighties. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question. We do a lot. I don't bring it up. I don't say mental health. Uh, if I'm in a, like, like tonight, I'm doing a, a, a seminar and um, I won't know everyone in the crowd. I know certain people, but I won't know everyone in the crowd. So I won't, you know, I, I, I won't use phrasing that, that I'm not going to say trigger or identify. I just, it's more generic. It's just saying, hey, listen, uh, um, self defense involves your emotional, psychological, physical well being. Well, that's the you know, just say mental health there, right? You know, like, uh, you know, adaptive courage, your ability to overcome fear, uh, health, financial, interpersonal, and violence. You know, I mean, it's all it's woven in there. And then if if somebody wants to self identify and go, look, I'm dealing with this, you know, then like I'll make a call uh, there. Like, is this like, hey, on a break, let's talk about this, or I'm going to put you in touch with with one of one of our our team who in his other job, other than the other side from teaching my methodology is a professional psychologist. And I've actually uh, referred a number of people to, you know, uh, uh, his name is Jeff DeTesso uh, and, and, and has Dave experiences as a result, but so I'll talk about it more globally as opposed to that, but we are, we are, um, like I said, we've got a program uh, specific to mental health that deals with the whole trauma informed with the whole uh you know it's a whole different language and a whole different you know i'm not wearing a human weapon shirt to, <laughs> to that seminar you know yeah no it makes sense now I've, I've heard some interviews you've done before and we're similar in the sense that we'll say stories or examples that people find uh quite inflammatory if you will and elicit quite emotional responses right. uh care to expand on why you do it because i know why i do it. On, um, why do I use provocative stories? Yeah, like I'll give you the one I remember you were telling a story uh, on an interview about you were speaking to a crowd of women and then used the example. They're like, oh, I'm not going to be aggressive. And you know, what if you go come home and the babysitter is like trying to like rape your child or something? Right. Right. Yeah. So, well, there's certain like, like when I'm doing the Be Your Own Bodyguard reframe and that's where, that's where that comes from. Uh, I, I, I will, like that story doesn't change. I know that 
that even if I haven't, I like, like sometimes in class, you, you know, you probably notice I, I, I swear from time to time. And uh, so in, in certain environments, I'll go, listen, does anyone have a problem with me swearing? Because I swear a lot. It's mm-hmm. typically used to uh, punctuate a point and not just don't just have a trash, trashy mouth. But I might say, look, you need to fuck this 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 predator up right now, you know. And and it's 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 an adjective or it's a noun or it's it's. But there are certain stories that I tell that are always uh, pushing the envelope on 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 that graphic, like whoa whoa whoa, like like hey, you come home and you're 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 specifically your child is has been stripped nude and tied to a kitchen table and there's a predator. And I, and I do that in a class with parents because I need to take them they, before it, uh, you know, and I, and I not, not only can't I not do it now on this call, I don't want to because it's, it's part of a, a very intentional, I like the word you use syllabus before, when we're taking people through uh, uh, realizations, self-awareness realizations that they are uh, stronger emotionally and psychologically then they realized so they're set up earlier where they go no i wouldn't do anything there and then we take them here and we go but what if it was your kid and 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 the the first time i did that i mean these these moms freaked out and they were angry at me Mm. angry with me going how dare you how dare you put that image in my mind and i go and i'm like well like i'm just describing a no you don't fucking bring my kid into this seminar i'm here to learn because nobody touches my kid i will rip their fucking heart out i will i will and and i'm going hold on a second like a minute ago when i asked you would you defend yourself against this rapist you know you were like no um well that's why we're learning like they were very demure very like Hmm. and then i said okay here's a new scenario and and i go that indignation that you're feeling right now towards me, that's what I need you to have when you need to defend yourself, whether your kid's there or not. So it's there as a very intentional point to bring them to this emotional, psychological boiling point and then make them realize, holy shit, all they had to do was imagine something horrible about to happen to somebody they cared about. And it was a superpower. And that became that became the emotional psychological fuel of the beer and bodyguard reframe. Mm. No, it makes sense. Like, and I swear a lot. I'm just I'm doing more listening today for once. Um, sure. But I'll tell people if you're uncomfortable with me swearing in class, how the fuck do you think you can handle someone being aggressive in your face? Because a lot of you know, I'm in Vancouver, a lot of Asians here, and they're to get them to be aggressive sometimes is really difficult, except my wife. She's fine with right. being aggressive. Right. Um, uh, and you have to get them to deal with it. And, and I often tell people, like, if you are never uncomfortable physically or emotional in a self-defense class, you're wasting your money. Because, again, it's all about training that nervous system. As I can teach you all the techniques in the world. But if you can't react when you're freaking out and you had a bad day and can't react effectively... Uh, an example like Krav Maga is known for its aggression. Now, when I first started, I was fresh out of the army and my co-teacher at the time was a very aggressive person. And I, as I started teaching, I'm like, there needs to be more than this. And then when I started going away from aggression only, people, you know, they're like, I don't want to talk about this. This is uncomfortable. I'm like, yeah, but half the self-defense stuff, you're not getting in a fight unless it's your job to do that. And it's a hard concept for people, I think, because they've been conditioned with, you said, like John Wick and all this, or, or you know, Israelis aren't the best at marketing for Krav Maga, so they've given it a not the best uh, image, unfortunately, that it's got to get rebranded. Um, but even now, like one of my instructors, Amit, because I'm, I train with many people, I don't really care. And he's like, listen, guys, cell phones everywhere. You can't just be the psychopath anymore like the 70s, right? And it's just, it's a hard thing to get in people's head, right? Just like people walk out when you make them uncomfortable <laughs> it's like uh integrity over over money is kind of a attitude i think which is good yeah, yeah. tough in a city like vancouver though but has that been uh you see that everywhere because like if you go to europe i don't know if you've been to europe like they want to go they don't like to talk as much or eastern europe or israel 
you see that everywhere yeah. just here uh, i mean i i've i've been fortunate enough to travel the world uh uh, uh teaching and 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 there's def definite uh cultural influences on on how people respond to stuff mm. um you know fortunately at, at this point you know i'm 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 in my 60s now and i've been doing this for 43 i've been training over 50 years but i've been teaching uh uh over 40 years you know i started teaching at a really young age i just i was a fanatic i loved it i i it came to me naturally because i uh you know, I, 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 I was a ski instructor at a young, young age. I grew up in Canada. You're either a ski or a skater. So I grew up in Canada and I, like, I was a, I was literally on, on the ski instructor roster at the age of 15. They had a special uh, provision uh, in their insurance. Cause I was so young. I was under 18. So I always loved coaching people. Uh, and, and I actually started uh, teaching when I was 17, not because I thought I was a, an instructor, but then professionally started when I was 20 in 1980. Um, and I, you know, this is uh, like a, like a, a circular answer to your question of do I see, what do I see around the world? Do I see similar, you know, um, uh, in, in the beginning, uh, uh, people wanted let's go physical. They want, they were like, let's, let's go. They, they wanted more of the aggression, you know, because I, I, I guess I, my panic attack videos from Panther in 1986, which were just all force on force. Uh, but people got into the fighting part. They wanted to get to the fighting part. They forget that the first video, this was released in 1986 was called cerebral self-defense, the mental edge. And it was, it was a lecture on understanding, you know, the, the mindset resilience stuff, but uh, the long answer and, and more philosophical answer is, is, you know, I've been doing this for so many years now, when people come to my seminar, they know, and they're hoping for the fear management, the mindset. So it's attracting, you know, uh, uh, people that, that understand there needs to be this balance and, and they, they, you know, it's not about uh, litigation and aggression and, and everyone's filming and CCTV. It's, I think for the most part, uh, People just want to friggin', you know, have a peaceful life and be happy. You know, there's a, there's, there's a, 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 I don't know if you know the company Caliber Press. They're, they're one of the, probably the world's largest police training uh, group. They're out of, of Chicago and they've been around for a long, long time. But uh, so I've written articles for them and, um, and did, they did some video assessment. There was one video that, that we did that took place in Israel. It was a CCTV video of three soldiers approaching a guy, uh, uh, you know, a suspicious guy. They asked him for his papers. He, uh, they're standing there all in full kit, all with their long guns, triangulated around this guy. And, um, you know, guys are standing there, indexed everything. And then let me see your papers. Da, 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 da. And the guy's like, stands up, he, he's shuffling for his papers. And as he pulls out his papers, He's, he pulls out his papers and pulls out a knife and stabs this the Israeli soldier in the neck, slashes at another one. Well, what do they all do? And I'd say this, uh, and I and I tell people, like if you're a selective listener, it sounds like I'm criticizing Krav Maga because my clickbait was what there's no more pure Krav Maga than if you're in the Israeli army. You know, because it hasn't gotten into, you know, the strip mall. It's not, it hasn't been watered down in any ways. It's like, like we really fight, this shit works. And I asked the question, why didn't they use the Krav Maga? Mm. Because how they stopped them was some other soldiers who are off a little bit further away uh, ran after the guy and shot him. Mm. And, and so there was no front kick. There was no gun to start. There was no knife to start. It was lead poisoning. And, uh, um, but I explain in there that when a stimulus is introduced too quickly, your executive function gets hijacked. If your executive function is hijacked, then your cognitive brain can't process. Your reactive brain de deploys with what I call the organic airbag, AKA start a flinch. Hands mm -hmm. come up, show danger. Um, and even though you're holding guns and stuff like that, it takes nano moments, depending on your skill, for you to recalibrate. What the fuck is going on? I mean, how many times has something happened to you or me where I'm like, 
And it could just be, I'm trying to turn on my phone and I'm like, what the fuck's going on? Why isn't this working? Did my phone just crash? And then you realize, oh, the battery's dead. Like you start to figure it out. Oh, I powered it off or it was, a, but everybody, we, and this is again, the truth of, again, my messaging and my, my languaging and my research is, and it's why I have human weapon. Like we're all human weapons, but we're all human mm. and we're human first. And, and you could be trained in, in 11th degree black belt and in every single martial art. And of course there are no 11th degree black belts, but you know, you're like, but you can, still, right. <laughs> but, but, but if, if I'm over here like this and I'm like, I have the best situation awareness program in the world, Jonathan, hold on one sec. Like, as soon as I look down to my phone, I don't have the best situational mm -hmm. awareness system in the world. I have the, nobody can distract me. Watch how I scan my perimeters. As soon as I look right, I'm fucked over here if somehow some ninja got to me right here. So, so what I always tell people is we need to blend our survival system because our survival system, the start of flinch, is truly our backup when our conscious cognitive situational awareness is compromised. And those three Israeli soldiers went in. I wrote an article called The Theory of Presumed Compliance. They went in there. This is 1993. I wrote it. Uh, we've got a military version and a law enforcement version because there's an assumption when if I walk up to you and I go, let me see your identification, that you're just going to comply with me, hmm. you know, um, in, and it's a fa it's a fascinating thing. And I don't know how I got onto that, <laughs> but, but it's, a, it's a fascinating thing to show that no matter how trained you are and ready and you understand forced options, you understand deadly force, you understand control and arrest you, that a stimulus can still happen at a certain proximity that's so quick um, that it bypasses uh, uh, all of your, your, your conscious ability in real time to go, oh fuck, this is happening. And then, and then send the message to do the right move. And this confuses self-defense experts and martial artists. And, 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 and so like the most important uh, area, if you really wanna make your students safe is to understand that neurobiology of, of survival. There's like the lecture I'm doing tonight, the opening lecture is called Violence Loves Speed. Hmm. And without understanding what that means, that sounds cool and sexy, but what these people are gonna, and these are all like, a lot of them are, are uh, security experts and um, uh, experienced martial artists. And when, when I say violence loves speed, they're like, okay, Tony's gonna show us how to get, get faster. Like, you know, and I'm like, no, 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 no. The violence is what's coming at you. Mm -hmm. And you need to understand the speed of physiology and you need to understand that action's faster than reaction. And in an ambush, the good guy's always reaction. The bad mm -hmm. guy's always action. In, Except in black ops, because they don't want to be seen and they're already there, right? Now it's, it's interesting. So like that's actually, it's what's called normalcy bias. Everything was fine yesterday. Everything is fine today. And for, for like, I served in the IDF in infantry. So I know what it's like there is people forget they're sleep deprived. They're actually not very trained in Krav Maga. It's a bit of a myth. Like unless you're one of the black ops units or in the counterterrorism units, you don't really learn it that much. So let's say you're on, um, as I was in some occasions, you're, two hours sleep in three days or four days or whatever. And you've been guard duty for eight hours, eight hours, eight hours, eight hours. And then you're doing other stuff and nothing's happened. You're like, ah, oh, nothing happened yesterday. Nothing happened today. Nothing happened tomorrow. And then boom, something happens. And, you know, and also there, it's a lot of young guys with no life experience. Uh, and that's why you see that flinch response. I see tons of videos like that. And they're just standing and chatting and then that little Palestinian brainwashed kid comes up running at them and they're like, ah, and somehow they don't all crossfire each other because I've seen that and they, they rarely do it. The shooting skills are good, at least. Um, and that's that's to do with like sort of the ethos and the story of Krav Maga. That's not exactly true. And the idea that, oh, you're in the IDF, you know, Krav Maga, you're a badass. I'm like, people need to stop saying that because I was there and it's a bunch of bullshit most of the time. Shooting skill is very good. But a lot right. of that other stuff, it's, uh, you know, and then the idea that the best Krav Maga guys are actually in the military, I'm not sure. A lot of the civilian guys are way better because they were also special force and then civilian yeah, or vice they can, versa. They continued their training after. Fair yeah, enough. Yeah, like I, I know you're, I know you know uh, Nir Maman. He's, I've trained with Nir. He's like that civilian 
martial artist first, then military, and then that. And you really see when he talks, he really understands. And he comes from a very first principle uh, perspective as well. And I think no matter the culture or where you're at, if you approach it from a first principle, like the, the neurological, it, it's a much more universal approach. And then you can argue about the techniques because in some places, right. like a lot of Asian techniques don't work very well against Westerners because we're bigger than them. And it's just a right. physics thing, right? Um, so on that note, like I remember, and I don't think this applies to you at all, um, but I find a lot of North American, uh, particularly American self-defense uh, experts are very insular in their perspective. So I had a situation once, very well-known, very respected American self-defense expert, and he came to Vancouver, not the crowd, the place people hosting it were very left-wing, so of course I got called a racist. But I was saying, um, how do you factor in cultural or regional differences in your self-defense tactics uh, if I'm in one area versus another, let's say I'm in Mexico City, right? A lot of people have guns. I have to expect situationally something else. Or if sure. I'm in Southside hey, Chicago hey as a white... Can we pause for one sec? Pause sure. the recording one sec? Stand by one second. Yeah. yeah. So uh, or, I was in the, like, or like Southside Chicago as a white guy. I need to know, like, I'm a target there. And right. uh, it's, I find like a lot of the American guys... They're just like the examples and situations that they give are so like specific to North America. And I'm like, but that that doesn't apply uh, globally. For example, a good example of this is the uh, the bystander effect. Are you familiar with it? So a very well researched uh, psychological phenomenon where people don't help till someone else helps. But in Israel, they don't really have that. And no one's really looked into it because everyone's trained. Someone's got to stop the threat. So if you have a threat there, you, they don't really have the bystander effect. People who are able to help will jump in. People who are not run away. And a lot of people, they, when they're teaching self-defense, I, I find they don't uh, think globally, especially with situations or things like that. Now, it doesn't really apply to you because the neurological approach that you're taking is universal. But what are your thoughts on like the differences globally and culturally and behavioral things that can alter our situation? You know what you're saying. What you're saying is true. I mean, if you're if you're asking me, why don't I think other martial artists think like that? Or, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, there's lots of people. Well, probably not lots, but you know, you what you turn on the news and, and you go, fifteen year old you know, kid runs into burning building, saves elderly woman, uh, you know, man jumps into freezing water to save this woman, you know, there are everyday heroes and, and what, what they do is they manage their fear. You know, the expression, you know, uh, you know, uh, am I paraphrasing it? If not me, then who, you know, that sort of, you know, um, I ask when I'm doing our fear management stuff, I, I go like, how do you decide, I, and we always talk about the courageous bystander in every seminar. So we, we address it. We go, how do you, how do you decide now to be the courageous bystander? And we have conversations about that. Uh, and the courageous bystander, like the, the, the theory of it is different than the reality of it, you know, and, and it, and it all comes down to, uh, consciously or unconsciously managing fear. You know, we we teach, we come back to the fear management all the time. Like, why why did a bunch of people stand there taking pictures of the accident, and somebody ran there, dragged the person out, and 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 you know, put a tourniquet, improvised tourniquet on the person, or tried to pull them out of the burning car? Everyone else stood back, going, "That car is going to blow up," and and two people ran there and tried to save somebody. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, some of it's training for in, in, in some cases, but uh, there's still elements of, of fear management in there as to why most people don't teach from, you know, like, uh, like, like, like a, a generic global perspective. I, I, I don't think a lot of people are malicious in that. I think you can't teach what you don't know. Mm. Uh, and, and if you, you know, if you, if, if you're training, was was uh um unintentionally biased like this is what we do yeah. uh it's again it doesn't have to be malicious i mean if you you go into any you go into any thread 
where like there's a viral video going and you'll see unconscious bias there and it's people aren't being malicious you see like a few weeks there's been like a like a huge influx of of uh um spontaneous broad daylight robberies happening right violence happening armed unarmed just freaking and you and you you can see the mindset that's what i carry that's what i carry that's what i carry you know uh uh that's why i have a knife that's why i do krav maga that's why i do you know jujitsu that's why i would never and you could see and nobody nobody posts going uh and i just wrote a, a very extensive article on this where you don't see anyone writing i wonder what i would have done there had I been surprised like that at then there were there were three three attacks you know that I that I isolate and I show the videos of uh you know one guy getting his watch ripped off as he's walking to his car car pulls over you know guys jump out fucking rush him fucking strip him of his shit and then the answer is oh that's why I carry or that's why I head on a swivel and I'm like are you kidding me with you're walking to your car, you're five feet away from your driver's door and a car pulls over and you know right away you're getting your gun out, you know right away you're gonna freaking do a flying side. Like, how do you fucking even arrive at that? Mm. You know, like, and and it's, and the, the, the hypothesis question I ask my readers is, I know what you could do. That's your theoretical brain. I could do this, I could do that. But what would you do if you were truly caught off guard like that? And the answer isn't, I'm never caught off guard. That's a stupid answer, right? So, so again, I just look at things like differently, man. And I don't, I don't look at, you know, if I'm traveling to another country, another area, I will be uh, conscious and aware of, you know, uh, if I need to check with the state department or, or individuals, I go, okay. Like, even when I check into a hotel in, in the States and I'm going to go find a place for dinner, I'll, I'll go to the front desk and I'll go, Hey, are there places like I should not be going if I don't have a gun? And they're like, mm -hmm. look at me like, like what? <laughs> and, and I'm going like, where should I not be walking or going? And they're like going, you know, and they'll go, this is the cool area, you know, but you know, uh, six months ago, some guys walked up to some people like a block over from Rodeo drive in Beverly Hills, pulled out guns and, and robbed a couple who were sitting at like a, at a, like an outdoor cafe. Mm. So you, you can go, that's a safe area until it's not safe. Well, California is falling apart. But anyways, uh, this is true. the the example that you gave me, it's like, my first question is, where where are they? Like, if you're in Vancouver, and that's your response, that's not a good response, because you're breaking the law already carrying a gun. But if you're in Mexico City, it's where kidnappings are a little more regular. It's like, oh, okay. And so like, that's kind of what I mean by the cultural thing. Like I, I'll give an example. I, in class, I had some new students the other day. They're not coming back. <laughs> uh, I was talking about driving and I used in, driving in India versus driving here. And I was like, if you drive like you're in India here, you're going to crash a lot. And I was like, in India, they drive like, like nothing matters, no rules. And this person was like, have you ever been to India? How do you know? I'm like, because I, I can listen to Indians, listen to their experience and understand that if I drive like I'm in Vancouver in India, I'm going to crash. And if I drive like in India in Vancouver, I'm going to crash. I had a friend who drove like he's in India here. His car looked like crap. Uh, and just really understanding not just okay, my neurological the, and what techniques I have, what are the rules, what are the cultural behaviors? Because, you know, uh, if you say you son of a bitch in uh, Canada, people are just like, okay. But like in the Middle East, if you say in the Hebrew, like Ben Zona, you son of a bitch, you're going to get punched because they, they really do take offense to the mother things. Here, it's just like, you son of a bitch, right? And if you don't understand these cultural differences, no matter how skilled you are, I find if you don't talk about them on a global scale, people don't, they have a very like confined mentality. And then they go to somewhere else and get in fights. And it's like, why'd that happen? It's like, well, you didn't learn the culture there, man. And I find people just don't like to talk about, it, especially with the current culture of you can't, you can't say that. <laughs> yeah, cancel culture. Yeah. yeah. It's very, very challenging. Um, one thing I did want to talk to you about before uh, you have to go is instructor creation. So uh, just give me a sec to sort of parse it out. So what are your, if you're creating instructor, what are your sort of standards and expectations? Because I have found 
that say let's say traditional martial arts you want to be an instructor you got to be there for like five to ten years and you really know your stuff you know in jujitsu which i do i started teaching a little bit when i was purple belt and it, i could get away with it a little bit a while ago now it's like no that was a mistake like i don't really understand it and then in the krav maga world it's so bad that they are like hey take this four-day course you're an instructor go run a school and i i hate that because you they don't have the sufficient skill let alone understanding after oh yeah you did six months of kramaga come take this four-day course you're an instructor and then you wonder why kramaga is shit in most of north north america so what are your sort of thoughts on instructor creation for self-defense uh, and martial arts to, to maintain a level of standards to your expectations yeah it's a controversial topic uh i i think it it you, you need to start with the uh um the end state like what is the goal what is the goal of of the uh the the uh accreditation or whatever you want to call it a certification um it, and this was really hard for me you know to slowly you know have this realization because it for for decades uh nobody I wouldn't let anyone teach. Hmm. It was like, no, you can't, you know, uh, you got to assist here. Let me, I'm going to watch. It was very, uh, very controlled. Um, because the focus was like, if you can't, if you don't epitomize and embody and, and actualize and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and then I realized that I was starting to get, um, as you when you're around long enough you start to hear like these stories of things that almost happen or things that did happen and 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 you realize that people were developing skills and awareness and spontaneous reactions and they were doing amazing things even though they didn't have the physical skill set that would make that would allow them to be on my demo team you know, so I was always looking at like, okay, you want to teach my system, then, you know, if we're a bunch of dancers and this is auditions, you're like, you hold on and you can't even do that. Like you can't even do half these moves properly. You no, know, get off the stage. Yeah. And, and, and I realized in, in the nineties that real violence always looks messy. So when you're practicing for finesse, uh, you're, you're not tracking and that became our our motto don't confuse technical with tactical mm -hmm. and so we realized the tactical mindset is one of the speed of recognition recognizing that you're in danger you will get a fear spike how quickly can you manage your fear spike and then what is functional movement given the scenario that model i realized well you don't need to train 10 years to understand that model you need to be a good listener and maybe maybe it's a 10 minute conversation and then <laughs> and it's like wow and so where we shifted and this is you you asked something specific you said how you know what are what are my thoughts on this as it relates to like a self-defense instructor or martial artist well no marsh like if you want to be like a high level jujitsu coach you, you just because you're a really good speaker and you care about people like if you don't if you don't know the moves and you haven't been doing this for years, you can't do it because jujitsu is chest with muscles. Mm -hmm. It's, it's moves and it's counters and it's moves and it's counters. And you, you can't fast track sensitivity and body awareness. And, 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 and so that's a, it's a good example using the jujitsu thing. Whereas I can look at the principles that I've uh, created, researched, uh, empirically tested, had, from tier one operators all the way down to women's shelters over decades taught, you know, how is it that I can teach such a spectrum from like, a, like, like that elite warrior all the way down to somebody who's a victim of violence. And what is it about the system? It's because forget the brand. What I'm looking at is physiology, biomechanics, and psychology how does the body actually move in 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 high stress situations not what could you do if you trained and so aspect 
can be learned uh, in a matter of months. And I equate this to, uh, and it's, it's, I think it's a very valid metaphor. If you take a CPR course and a stop the bleed course and you spend a day with a paramedic, not even like the world's best doctor, right? Just like, like a paramedic, a firefighter, they run you know, tactical first aid courses for civilians, right? And it's a four, five, or six hour course. At the end of that half a day of training, you literally have life saving skills. Mm. But you're not a paramedic and you're not a doctor, and you're not a brain surgeon, right? So the black belt might be like the brain surgeon and the, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the blue belt or the brown belt, uh, you know, might be like the doctor. And then, you know what I'm saying, in, in that scale. But the civilian, the citizen that graduated that course is, can actually be sitting in a restaurant and someone is choking on food. And if they don't, if they manage their fear, they can run over and go, oh, I'm going to do something and I'm going to help this person. They mm -hmm. can pull up. And, and this is an important metaphor, because if I say to you, like we have a two day instructor course. People go, that's bullshit. You're a scam artist. You know, first of all, do your research. I've been doing this for like since since uh, uh, I don't know how many we're like we've done like we're approaching ninety instructor courses over the last thirty years. This is what we do. But I'm not teaching people how to be martial artists. You can't be a martial. You can't learn martial arts in a weekend. But can you learn like a paramedic teaching a group of citizens? This is how you put on a tourniquet. This is how you do this. How life saving skills. And we're teaching that. What are the three Ds? Detect, diffuse, defend. How do you manage fear? Here's a simple flow chart on, on where people lock up and what they can do if they hit that fear loop, that fear spike, and how it hijacks the brain. This is what happens when the body flinches. And inside that startle flinch, this is, this is a, a simple muscle recruitment principle. And if you remember fingers played outside 90 and get your axis forward, you are now in the strongest position, a core to extremity position that anyone can hit. Even if you're not trained, you know to do that. If I said to you, um, you're, if you're untrained, Jonathan, and I said, uh, uh, dude, uh, help me push this car out of the snow. You know, you're not going to get in the karate kid stance and, you know, try and kick the car, what you're going to do is you're going to get against the back of the car, you're going to splay your fingers, you're going to get your arms outside 90, and you're going to dig in and you're going to try and push. And I'll go, that's a spear stance, great. Like, like the application of it, you're pushing furniture upstairs, a couch, like mm. you, you, the body naturally knows how to move. That's the human weapon principle. So this is a long detailed answer to say it took me years because it started off with, look, if you can't fight, you can't teach. Mm. Uh, if you can't do these moves, if you can't, you haven't been with me long enough. You, if I can't see this, sorry, you know, you're cut. You don't make the team keep training. And then I realized is my original, my original, uh, I got asked when I was 20 years old, what is it that I wanted to do? And I said, I really would like to help make the world safer. Hmm. And it was like this venture capitalist said to me, he goes, how the hell are you going to do that? I said, well, I, I, I have this vision for a, a generic approach to self-defense that doesn't matter what gender you are. It doesn't matter your background. It's just this holistic approach that blends psychology and physiology. I, I had the insight. I didn't have the system. And that's all I've been doing for the last, you know, 40 plus years is, uh, you know, based on that vision and that mission. Uh, so this is very controversial and we get a lot of flack and people who don't understand it. Uh, hate on us if i could monetize my haters i'd be very wealthy um and and it's this idea that that and it's, think about how rude disrespectful and how ironic it is because i've had professional martial artists say blower's a scam artist and I'd, I'd fight any one of his instructors because i you know and i'm like going you're a fucking bully but and you run a martial arts school and in your yellow pages ad it says teach your kids how not to be bullied and you're a bully online. So, so my, my concept is this, man. If I've got somebody who wants to teach how to people to be courageous bystanders, they need to understand how to manage their own fear. 
If I need somebody to be able to uh, protect themselves suddenly and dramatically, they need to know how to convert the startle flinch. Because even a trained person, as we discussed, if it's a random, sudden, violent encounter, you're going, fuck, there's MMA fighters and boxers that flinched in the ring. And that's not a random, spontaneous event. They got actually film <laughs> on the fighter and, and they agreed to that fight. There was consent, there was preparation, there's awareness. And there's still, uh, there still could be movement that, that creates that startle flinch in a professional combat sport. Mm. So that's what we're teaching. And we have uh, hundreds of affiliates around the world who uh, have craw backgrounds, boxing, MMA, Thai boxing. And they're just, what, so what, you, what, what draws people to our research are the professional conscientious people who recognize there's something missing in our protocol and it's nothing to do with their skill or their passion or their business sense. It's, 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 I had a guy uh, on a, on a business call recently and he said, so you're just using physiology, uh, a proper mechanics, psychology. And he said, and he, and he kind of was alluding like anyone could figure that out. Right. Mm. And I said, yeah, anyone could figure it out. I happened to, to be the guy that pioneered it. Mm. Um, and it, and it took me decades. And he's like, looking at me, it's a Zoom call with a bunch of other potential instructors. And, and I go, how old are you, sir? And he goes, I'm 50. Sure. And I'm like, I appreciate these questions. So, you know, let's say you, you go off on your own and you do your own research. It took me probably 30 years for it to completely crystallize in the proper doses, right? It's been an experiment, organic experiment. I said, so when you're 80, you can have your own system, right? Yeah. You know, and that's that's an interesting thing about th this this era of RBSD, uh, a term that 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 I don't I don't like reality based self defense. You got all these guys that are masters and they're 23, 24, invented their own systems and stuff like that, and 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 it's bizarre. It's like wow, like you're gonna look back at that when you're 30, when you're 35, when you're 40. And I understand it. You know, when I was 25, I was teaching at my own school. Um, and I was like, holy shit, like, I'm, like I'm doing my own thing. But I also understood that I, that, that I had a lot to learn, that I was still a sponge. I was still absorbing. Hmm. Um, anyways, I, I, I went off on a tangent, man. But the, the, the answer is we, we've got a... a uh, like our, our trainer protocol is three months uh, with me in we, we, we do this garage gym program online where I teach uh, four days a week. You got to do that for three months where I get to know you and I get to see you and you're actually being trained by the guy that that, you know, it's not like, you know, watching a video. We're actually interacting. Um, and that allows me to vet you as a personality, your resiliency. Are you coachable and how you move? So, um, so that's a three month minimum. And then there's a weekend course that we do, uh, live online. That's teaching you about the, the skill set of coaching. How do you triage somebody not for the medical sense, but you know, everyone's got things they're doing wrong when they do things, you know, how do you pick the most important thing and how do you coach somebody through that? And it's, and then it's a blend of, these are the essential drills. These are the fundamentals. Um, and, and, uh, how do you teach it under our, we've got a, a, a kind of a map of violence called the timeline of violence. And it's, it's, it's a great, it's a great graphic, but it shows what are the skills of detect and avoid? What are the skills of defuse and deescalate? And what are the skills of defend? And, and, um, and can those people teaching that, can they fight? No, they can't enter. Now, like some of them can. I mean, I've got people that have been, you know, we, we had a guy that just went through the program. He's been a martial artist for 30 years. He was a cop and, and, uh, and he's, uh, uh, runs a boxing gym right? mm. and he's like 225 pounds. You know, he's a cop, he's a boxer, he's been a martial artist. Can he fight? Fuck yeah. But he, he goes, you know what? The people who want to really learn how to defend themselves don't have time to do 30 years of this and, and do that and do they just want to learn, hey, I just want to get home safe. I want to spot danger and get the fuck out of the way. Mm. 
So that you know, full circle answer is when I changed what, what the objective was for the course. The objective was how do I enhance the safety and survivability of people who don't aren't fanatics like you and me that don't want to spend study martial arts and violence their whole life. That's not their calling. They just want to go to work and go, hey, what's that? Oh, fuck, move, right? Mm. And, and I mean, the answer there isn't studying a, a technical martial art. The answer there is very much like that first aid course. And at the, if the, at the end of the first aid course, you go, I need to go deeper. Guess what? There's a level two. And if you, at the end of it, you're so inspired that you want to do this, you can volunteer as a firefighter or a paramedic and you go to more training. And if you're so fascinated with it, you decide to stop being an accountant or, or whatever, and you go to, to, you go to medical school, right? So like, but medical school is like, I want to get my black belt. Mm. It's not for everybody. You don't need that to, 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 to stop the bleed. Yeah. I just thought of it as like, I'm wondering if there's like, in order to teach a seminar or just like your friend, you don't need to be that black belt. But if you want to run a school indefinitely, it's maybe it's a better idea, I think, in that sense. Um, it only depends, Jonathan. It depends on what you're marketing. If I mm. listen, I got some friends that run an amazing jujitsu school uh, near me. They got, I mean, it's 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 world renowned. Uh, UFC fighters come train there at, uh, you know, down, down in Solana beach, uh, studio 540. Um, I I've gone in there and like, I'm, I get ragdolled, mm. right. I'm like, Oh fuck. Oh shit. I didn't know my body bends like this. Okay. Tap, 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 tap. Right. It's jujitsu. I, I, I would never in a million years go, I want to open up another school. I love you guys. I got money. I, I, I'm a good businessman. I would hope they would say to me, you, but you, you're a novice at this art. Mm. You can't teach it. You could own the school, but you got to hire somebody else to teach it. So, yeah. so the only thing I would say to you is it depends on what you're marketing. Mm. If, so I've got people who are marketing my research on on self-defense and they're making people safer mm. but they but it's we're not bravado we don't say learn how to fight or learn how to fight in a day it's like we're not teaching you how to fight we're teaching you how to not fight and 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 what are the skills from self-awareness to situational awareness to primal gross motor movement versus complex motor skill and and how do you stand and run and get the fuck out of there mm. and if you do that and you want more i tell all of I tell all of my instructors who don't have their own deep martial art practice. Um, if you have a student that does this, this, this workshop and they go, man, I need more direct them to a Thai boxing school, to a Krav Maga school, to jujitsu school, like make sure you have relationships with people you vetted and they're good. So let's say I'm up in Vancouver uh, or my seminar and they go yeah i'm in i'm in 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 another world where we could travel uh, and they come and they go uh hey this this be your own bodyguard seminar was great but i feel like i need more i really want to uh, understand aggression more and I, and I need to do some more drills i might say hey check out urban tactics you know uh, uh, uh or the, or someone says i'm still so nervous about the ground i go listen um there's a gracie school or there's a, this school up near you check it out because the people who are least afraid of the ground are the people that are good on the ground it doesn't mean that you should go to the ground in a real fight but at least you have that option and you've you've eliminated that fear so we do like you know redirect if somebody wants more training oh well, that makes sense i do that too i tell people you know if they want to get a black belt and crowd from me i'm like you got to go get a blue belt in jiu-jitsu or judo or something to show me when you're open-minded to you understand your limits and you develop your skills also, I realized early on, like Krav and ground was like <laughs> no good. So I'm like, I need to develop these skills. And I love jujitsu. Now, I know you need to get going soon. But yeah. I had one last sort yes, of sir. thought question. And you can go as much or little. But as someone who's been studying fear for the last forever. And how, how have you been feeling on this topic, sitting back over the last three years, looking and being like, you're all just a bunch of terrified people, right? As someone who's been studying fear and like, this is what I'm, I'm face palming constantly. I'm like, you guys are just, you're all just terrified. 
How does like being someone who knows this? Yeah. Um, let me think about that for one sec. Hey, can we pause for one sec again? Yeah. Stop. Okay. Right. So, yeah, obviously uh, you're being a little cryptic. You're talking about the state of the world, right? The whole, <laughs> right? Um, it's interesting. I got I to gotta reach out. I, I just forgot his name, but one of my first first interviews in the beginning of the no fear podcast was with a gentleman who studies fear and propaganda out of the uk and there was a whole bunch of research on uh uh you know how this was used during world war ii uh and um it was very fascinating i gotta go listen to it again and maybe get him back on on that on the podcast um the the, the how fear is being weaponized globally is I mean it's 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 a masterclass in 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 manipulation, mm. uh, and it, but it's scary in the sense that there are legitimate things to be fearful of, but it's, it's so the the biggest distinction I make I don't teach people uh, that there's no such thing as no fear and no fear. In fact, uh, just to Here's the, the shirt I'll be wearing tonight, right? Yeah. People get it. It's not N-O fear. It's K-N-O-W fear. And the um, you need to know it. And, and so it's this idea of people aren't researching and, and, and developing a mindset that says, okay, uh, uh, fear of the unknown will eat you up and destroy you. And now you're, you're, you're literally like just the the puppet the news says this the the twitter says this uh politician says this and there are people who are super intelligent who are just doing like what they're what they're being told like mm. i mean i and you've you've seen it but I, like i'm in a minute at a dinner or out and when I say super intelligent, I mean like this is a functioning member of society that that has, for the purpose of just what's going on, has lost all critical thinking skills. Hmm. And they so the people are choosing fear as opposing as opposed to choosing to understand that fear. And that's the whole idea behind no fear is is can you look at the fear and and using some very specific uh, uh, questions and a model change your relationship with it so you understand what you need to do and it's and it's no different than like instead of instead of a virus if we had said if the government just came on and big tech just came on and and what they did is they just started talking about shootings and stabbings and rapes and abductions and uh human trafficking and that was all you saw in the news hmm. and they said listen uh i want you to wear masks so nobody can uh see whether you're smiling or frowning and uh and there's uh, research that that wearing masks actually reduces the chances of you getting or or attacked guess what hmm. they everyone would be wearing masks and if we said like we're going to shut down stuff until we figure out how to stop all this violence. Yeah. Right. Like half of the world would, would still do that. And the other half would go, well, wait a minute. Can't we improve our situational awareness? Yeah. Can we improve our de-escalation strategies? Can we learn how to defend ourselves? Because there's enough research to show that isolation, lack of movement, lack of sunshine uh, leads to, depression and and suicide and and aggression and that we're we're social creatures we need to be out but it's 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 amazing um and listen uh i go and like shaking hands with people at an event i'm remembering don't do this after and you know just rub your eyes and put your hand on your mouth after shaking hands with like 20 strangers like what is that Hmm. Well, two years ago, I never thought about that. I wouldn't go to the bathroom and wash my hands for 20 seconds. Hmm. So even here as a fear management expert, through osmosis, it's in my head. Because here's the thing. You know, if I asked you, hey, do you want to get it? 
you go, no. But the reality is like, like, and uh, we had this conversation the other day, if they had given every variant of the generic flu a scary mm. name and had everybody talking about the flu mm. and how many people die from the flu, but gave it a scary name for every variant mutation, this could have started decades ago. Yeah. Right. They, you know, my understanding, they did attempt it with the 1980s uh, swine flu. But SARS and bird flu and all that. To ask your question is, uh, while I wouldn't want to intentionally get it, I don't really care based on my age, my health. I've been taking vitamin D based on the research and all that other stuff. And now that the new variant is out, it's probably the best one to get because then I get right. immunity. <laughs> it's, 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 it's bizarre. But the message here is this. Listen, there are people that are truly afraid. And that's what I said earlier, that, you know, fear spike creates doubt, doubt creates hesitation, hesitation becomes, becomes procrastination, procrastination becomes fixation, unchecked, that fixation becomes clinical or non-clinical anxiety, depending on, you know, who you are and, and what you're, what you're, you're predisposed to. Um, and, but the message in the whole thing is we, we, we need, when, whenever we get a fear spike, we need to ask ourselves, what is that? Do I understand this? And you said like the most important thing is you said, based on the research, I'm doing this. You're a critical thinker. You go, well, what the fuck is this? You know, and, and that's, and that's what people need to do to see the inconsistencies, to see the manipulation, you know, you don't, you don't see uh, uh, commercials for, Hey, take this, take this shot and you could win a million dollars or get a free donut or yeah. you don't see that for, <laughs> for, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, helping people cure uh, uh, diabetes or losing weight. I mean, there's so much research on on your fitness and and your body mass as a as a as a, uh, a predisposition to being impacted by this or other comorbidities and stuff like that. But the you know, there's so much controversy around it. And I say with all due respect, because I know people who, who've gotten it, people who are close to me that that uh, it fucked them up and scared the shit out of them. Uh, you know, only to find out they had an underlying condition they never knew about. Mm. Uh, uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's legit, right? But at the end of the day, you go, okay, so am I just going to not live anymore for fear that this might happen? I mean, that's, that's like any other fear that, that turns you into, you know, an isolationist. You're just hanging out in your freaking house and not talking to other humans or leaving the house. Mm, yeah no it makes sense like i don't want to go on too long because i know you have to go but it's like for yep. me my fear as a jew is the way people are behaving i'm sorry is how the germans were behaving sure pre, pre holocaust and people are like no 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 no, we're not committing this and i'm like it's the behavior that's the, that leads right. to that and i had right. some you know i made a nazi reference on facebook to the governments with their the thing and the jewish community the few that still have friends we're just like going after me. And I'm right. like, have you guys uh, lost it? Like, yeah. do you not recognize the pattern? And it, it just, it, it does very much revolve around fear, fear of being ostracized, fear of, uh, you know, going to jail, fear of penalty, fear of this. Uh, and if anyone really digs in Canada, if you really fight a lot of these things in court, you usually, you're usually fine. But I, I watched a lot of uh, martial artists who we got hit hard. Uh, and they're like, we need to do something about it. Da, 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 da. And then you saw two groups of people uh, being the Canadian way. You saw the people who just over time switched to, we need to do what we're told because that's what's going to keep my business. And then you had everyone else that's like, uh, yes, we'll follow the rules. And then they're following the rules. Right. <laughs> and I just saw the like, fear come through in different forms, whether it was fear of losing your business, fear of not fitting in. I've been pretty vocal locally. That's why some of the local guys won't talk to me right now. Um, uh, you know, all sorts of fears. And, and the, you just see the power of groupthink. And I'm just like, man, like, did we learn nothing? <laughs> it's, it's a little scary. It's a little scary because, um, because before, you know, they tried, they, they tried to do this before. And everyone always tries to do it. But, but it, you know, if you go back in time, like how did how did you how did you manipulate the masses? Well, now they've got big big tech, 
yeah. right? So the big pharma and big tech and the government working together. Uh, so th they can literally within 24 hours create some sort of hysteria or, or, or energy uh, where now everyone's talking about whatever, you know, whatever the propaganda is. Um, if, if you remove big tech from all of this, like this movement, you know, you would eradicate it all. And people need to realize, I mean, at some point, and it's mind boggling, the, you know, the, the politicians work for us and everyone's forgotten that. Mm. And, and if there's enough resistance, like you don't see any of the, the resistance or the movements on the news, right? Like there's like nobody's showing any protests. Mm. I mean, but if you're a critical thinker, you're going, why is that? Why are they censoring real doctors? Why are they removing licenses? Why are they banning this? Why are they deplatforming? You know, so it's a, it's, 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 it's disgusting to me. Yeah. On, a, on that note, just to tie it up, Facebook openly admitted in court their fact checkers yeah. are opinion. <laughs> I was like, ah. I mean, I mean I, uh, like I've been I've been shadow banned for months and months where I can't communicate. I can't, yeah. you know, posts that would have 2000, you know, likes now have 43, you know, mm. follow me. You got to type in my whole name and then a warning comes up going, are you sure you want to follow? Tell me what you know um and then and then to to say oh these are just the people with opinions well you know well you need to fucking lift your bands then yeah you know it's just, to it's, start it, it sets up the legal machine that takes forever so i think because i know you got to go is there any final things you want to add in no uh, hopefully hopefully your 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 audience uh dig some of the thoughts there uh hmm. you know if you're if you've if you're a martial artist and you follow this podcast and you've heard shit things about high gear and spear and all that, uh, then just like the jab, do your own research, mm. you know, don't, don't let someone else's propaganda, uh, you know, um, uh, influence, influence your, your behavior online, do your own research. If you've got questions, I don't, I don't outsource any of my communication. So if you send me an email or post on something and tag me, uh, whatever answer you get, it's not some bot and it's not one of my staff. It's always me. Um, and, um, you know, if you're out there doing your best to, uh, if you're an instructor listening to this and, and you know, hopefully this, this talk inspired you to, to look more into the, the, the neuroscience and the physiology, because that's, that will always be the missing link in somebody's ability to protect themselves in an ambush. You know, in, in different confrontations, your training, your mindset, and your skill is, is what you need. But at the end of the day, uh, it, it all comes down to all of our ability to manage fear, whether it's the propaganda, whether it's I'm going to start my business. You know, I would say fear throttles everything we do from who we talk to, therefore, to who we who we marry and who our friends are. Uh, it, it fear throttles like you go, man, I can't lift that weight. Now, you know, you, you can't PR because you're looking at the weight, right? You're going, that's too much. You, you know, too uh, uh, selfishly with what we do, um, fear is going to influence whether you stand up and do what you need to do for yourself or your family, uh, whether you're not going to hesitate when you have to defend yourself. Mm. Um, so, um, so check out the fear stuff, man. Makes sense. Uh, last thing, how do people find you on the internet? That's harder. <laughs> every day uh what, what i would do is uh, uh again if you're on instagram just go follow spear.system go there they're starting to shadow ban that page uh but that's uh spear.system is is my is uh of course our self-defense protocol and then tony blower on instagram i'm on facebook i'm on linkedin uh and our website are if you go to blower training systems.com that'll take you to all our high gear our fear our no fear stuff so it's blower my last name b-l-a-u-e-r systems uh blower training systems i don't even know my url blower training systems.com hey well thanks for coming on and, and taking time out of your busy day appreciate it thanks man Thank you for listening to the Warrior's Den podcast. If you like this podcast and our content, make sure you support us in the many various ways you can. The easy and free ways start with liking, subscribing, following, and leaving a positive review wherever you may be listening or watching.
You're listening to The Warrior's Day. The Warrior's Day. Brought to you by Urban Tactics Krav Maga. Turning lambs into lions. <laughs>